students, it's exciting to have you back in this second video lecture installment on Chapter 21's coverage of nuclear chemistry, which is frankly a very cool, intellectually engaging subject, at least for me. In today's lecture, I'm going to teach you guys about nuclear reactions. Are you ready? Okay, let's get started. Now, elements that have unstable nuclei, and I'll tell you what that means a little later on, have the tendency to spontaneously undergo changes that alter their nuclear compositions. For example, uranium-238, which has this symbol right here, spontaneously emits or gives off a helium atom, which has this symbol right here, according to this equation. Now, as you look at this equation closely, you can't help but notice that the uranium atom, as it gives off this helium atom, becomes or transforms into thorium-234. Why? The reason is because mathematically, the atomic numbers of everything on the left side of the equation have to add up to be equal to the atomic numbers of everything on the right side of the equation. You'll notice that this also applies to their atomic weights. So look here. You can see that on the right side of the equation, as we look at the upper left quadrant, there's a 4 next to this helium and a 234 next to thorium. 4 plus 234 adds up to make 238, which is the atomic mass of this particular uranium atom. Similarly, 2, which is the atomic number for helium, is down here in the lower left-hand quadrant. And 90, the atomic number for thorium, is in its lower left-hand quadrant. 90 plus 2 is equal to 92, which is the atomic number for uranium. So mathematically, that all makes sense. Does it make sense conceptually that that would actually happen in real life, or how? Well, I think, yeah, because often real life is an extension of math. Isn't that cool? We can say then that for any generic nuclear reaction in which a reactant emits or gives off a particle, such as this one, the uh, superscript A has to be equal to C plus E, and the subscript B has to be equal to the subscripts D plus F. The identities of X, Y, and Z then are determined completely by their atomic numbers B, D, and F. So whatever B, D, and F are, you can find those numbers boxes on the periodic table, and the element next to them, is the element that each of these symbols, x, y, and z, represent. Please notice, by the way, that the process shown here does not involve electrons at all. These things are not ions like a y plus or a z minus or anything like that, which is the kind of chemistry that we've talked about all year long up to this point. This is compound x losing neutrons and or protons from its nucleus, not electrons from its orbitals. This is therefore nuclear chemistry and is why this kind of process is distinct from the kind of chemical reactions we've talked about in all of the other chapters so far. Hopefully I have the ability to make that distinction mentally. So reactions like this one in which some element emits another element and another particle are called radioactive decay reactions. When a helium atom is emitted in such a reaction, the helium atom is called an alpha particle. Or if you want to use the funny little Greek symbol, you can use this little alpha down here, alpha particle. Thus, radioactive decay that emits a helium atom is often called alpha decay. This takes us to a great chapter problem. In balancing the nuclear equation shown here, the identity of element E is... <gasps> I'll let you figure that out on your own. Now, how about this one? This reaction right here is an example of what? I'm not going to answer it for you, but I'll give you some hints. What you're going to want to do is mathematically put a number up here in the superscript in the upper left-hand corner that when added to 206 equals 210. You'll also want to uh, put the number right here in the lower left-hand corner that when added to 82 turns into 84. The number at the lower left-hand corner tells you what element belongs here. Once you figure that out, hopefully you'll be able to figure out the answer to this question. Now here's another one. The missing product from the reaction shown here is what? Just like we did with the previous one, what you'll want to do is make sure that your math balances. Whatever number goes up here in the upper left-hand corner has to be a number that when added to 10 gives you a total number that is equal to the same number as 13 plus 1, which is 14. Okay. Similarly, number in the lower left-hand quadrant has to be a number that when added to 5 gives you the same number as 7 plus 0, which is 7. That lower left-hand quadrant number is the atomic number for whatever element goes in this blank space. So you just go to the box on the periodic table that corresponds to that atomic number, and you can identify the element. I'll let you do that on your own. We now turn to a different but also equally exciting topic, that of beta particles. 
Now, as you might have surmised from the past couple of slide examples that I gave you, nuclear decay can also emit other kinds of particles besides alpha particles. For example, some nuclear decay reactions emit high energy electrons, abbreviated as this symbol right here, a zero up top and a negative one down bottom. These particles are called beta, or beta if you're using the cute little Greek symbol, particles. And this process is called beta emission. Beta emission actually creates a proton from a neutron in the nucleus, which in turn increases the reacting element's atomic number by one AMU, thereby changing it to the next element to the right on the periodic table. Here's an example. If you have iodine emit a beta particle, you'll notice that mathematically it creates an element of xenon. Xenon actually has one more proton than iodine. Mathematically, that all makes sense because 54 plus a negative 1 equals 53, which is the atomic number of iodine. Conceptually, however, it seems really strange. How is that even possible? Are we creating stuff from thin air? Well, the answer is no. Once again, if you do the math, you'll notice that iodine here must have 78 neutrons. That's the difference between 131 and 53. How many neutrons are there in xenon over here? Because the atomic mass didn't change, there are 77 neutrons. So one neutron disappeared. How did it disappear? Well, what happened is that neutron turned into a proton by giving off an electron or a beta particle. So once again, a neutron can transform into a proton and an electron. That electron is emitted as a beta particle, and that proton now goes down into the lower left-hand quadrant here, 54, and changes the identity of the element, in this case, from iodine to xenon. Isn't that wacky? I know it is, but it totally does happen. This type of radioactive decay, once again then, is called beta emission. And this particle right here, which is an electron, is called a beta particle. Okay, we're now going to move on to talk about something very exciting called gamma particles. Some nuclear decay reactions give off high energy photons, which are just high energy forms of electromagnetic radiation. These particles are called gamma particles, which are abbreviated using this symbol. Now, parenthetically, it's interesting to note that the original Incredible Hulk was created when Bruce Banner got exposed to gamma radiation or gamma particles. Yeah, so we have to be careful when we're exposed to gamma radiation lest it might accidentally turn us into a heaving green monster. Okay, that's all I'm going to share you about this right now. Let's move on to a different type of subatomic particle called positrons. Some nuclear decay reactions give off something called a positron, which is a positively charged electron abbreviated using this symbol. What? Yeah, it's totally a real thing. We can see that mathematically in this example where I've got carbon 11 emitting a positron, once again, a positively charged electron. It's got a plus one in the lower left-hand quadrant and by so doing, transforming itself into a boron 11 isotope. You'll see that when we add up the numbers, zero plus 11 equals 11 and one plus five equals six, it all makes sense. This process, you should notice, changes the reacting element, in this case carbon-11, into the element just before it on the periodic table because one of its neutrons is converted into a proton. Let me explain how that works. You'll notice here that this carbon-11 has five neutrons and six protons. In contrast, this boron-11 has six neutrons and five protons. So in this process, what's happened is the carbon has lost one proton and gained a neutron. How in the world does that happen? Conceptually, what's occurring is you can imagine the proton giving off its positive charge in the form of this positron, and by so doing, it turns into a neutron. Hence, one proton is consumed and one neutron appears. That transforms the identity of the element from carbon into boron. Is that wacky? Absolutely, but it totally does happen. Here's one more piece of important info, just so you know. Positrons have very short lifespans because as soon as they collide with another electron anywhere, they form two gamma particles according to this equation. You can see mathematically, I've got my positron right here colliding with an electron anywhere. One plus a negative one equals zero, zero plus zero equals zero. That yields two molar equivalents of gamma particles, which of course are bad because if you're exposed to them, they will turn you into a heaving green superpowered monster. Okay, in reality, what they'll actually do is just kill you. But let's not get into details. Instead, let's move on to another type of nuclear process, that of electron capture. 
The last nuclear reaction we'll discuss is electron capture, in which an element captures a high-speed electron and incorporates it into its nucleus. This decreases the element's atomic number by one, changing it to the element immediately before it on the periodic table. Here's an example. I've got rubidium-81 that captures a very, very high-speed electron. Mathematically, that 37 plus a negative one turns into a 36, so we now have krypton-81. Now, when I talk about this, this is different from an electron being captured into an electron orbital around an element. We've talked about tons of cases like that. For example, sodium chloride, where the chlorine accepts an electron from sodium and becomes a chloride anion. That is an incorporation of electron into its outermost orbital. That is not what this is. This is a high-speed electron going past and through all of the orbitals, punching through all of them, and going into the nucleus. When it does that, it combines with a proton and turns into a neutron. You can see looking here, for instance, that this rubidium has 44 neutrons and 37 protons, but the krypton has 45 neutrons and 36 protons. In other words, we've lost a proton and gained a neutron. How did that happen? Once again, as this electron came in to the nucleus, it combines with one proton, so we lose that proton. And the positive charge in the proton, the negative charge in the electron combine to form, dun da da dun a neutron. We can see then that as the opposite of positron emission, electron capture converts a proton in the nucleus into a neutron. OK, so this table taken from our text summarizes all of our symbols for nuclear particles that we've talked about thus far, and ever will talk about in this chapter, at least. You're welcome, of course, to pause and look at this to review. Here's another table that summarizes all of our nuclear reactions, alpha decay, beta emission, positron emission, and electron capture. Once again, you're welcome to pause this here and take a closer look at it for review. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll begin teaching you about what makes an element radioactive or nuclearly unstable. <laughs> Till next time, guys, have a great rest of your day.